Hey now, how we doing? Who's excited for Memorial Day weekend? Yeah, summer's here, it's good stuff. All right, so uh, as the voice of God said, I'm Pete Stein, Global President of Merkel. Excited to be here with you today. Alicia Kreiner from Galderma is gonna join me in a few minutes, but I just wanted to set a little bit of context for our conversation. So uh, at Merkel, we say we power the experience economy. The experience economy, you know, essentially we believe that the brands that win in the future are the brands that are gonna win on experience. You guys probably all believe that because you're here at this conference. Um, but just an example to bring that to life of really what that means. I was talking with a friend the other day and she's been sick for a bit. And uh, she, I was asking her about her doctor's visits and how it was going and she told me she went to One Medical and I said, oh, I've always been curious about One Medical. Like, what's that experience like? How have you liked that? And she said, hey, the doctors have been great on every visit that I've gone, so that's good. And I love the app. I love that I can make an appointment in five minutes. I love that I, if I need to get a nurse live on the line, I can do that within a few minutes. I love that I can refill my prescriptions just like that and I don't have to talk to anybody. And so she was talking all about the experience around the core product and service, which is the doctor experience. And that is the experience economy. We care as much about the products and services as we do, well, I should, the other, let me put it the other way. We care as much about the experience around the products and services as we do about the products and services themselves. So that's what we mean. Now, as we think about what marketers need to do or what organizations really need to do to think about this future and equip themselves to win in the experience economy, there's four core areas that we think are important. First is around growth and agility, and that's about being an adaptive organization about thinking about running your business or your core platforms as a product and not, not a set of projects. That's a, an important mindset to move to, have that agility to be ready for anything. Uh, second one is future ready tech. Obviously you guys are here, so you're passionate about that and you're excited about that. Something that is, is core to the future is, is to have the tech in place to enable that future. Customer first experiences, this is something at Merkle that we're really passionate about. Uh, we built an identity product that allows our clients to better recognize who it is that they're talking to, connect that profile to an actual individual, and then activate that individual, not just across their own ecosystem, but across media as well, and have one view of, cust of the customer throughout. It's something that we think is really powerful and important, and our partnership with Data Cloud and our integration with Data Cloud has been a big part of that, so we're excited about that. And then finally, the outcomes that we're all trying to drive are not just you know, an individual sale, but a lifetime of sales. And that's about building that loyalty with the customer and the brand engage engagement that enables it. And, and we're gonna talk about all of this with Alicia in a minute. So, uh, you know, as you're, we're entering this world of AI and this next wave of, um, you know, really a, ma a massive uh, transformation that's gonna happen. I think in the ways, I, I was talking with a former colleague the, uh, just earlier today who I bumped into, we were talking about how different the world's gonna look in five years. And I think as, as you know, people who are uh, here to drive that change for our clients or for ourselves or for our clients, depending on where you're sitting in, in this uh, ecosystem, it's so important to not just think about what you're gonna get done this year, but what, where you're driving towards, what you think the vision is. And you may not know, right, where there's gonna be lots of twists and turns, but having a perspective on where you're headed is critical. So I would ask you all to think about, as 2030 is about five years out, where do you wanna be? Where do you need to take the order? What is the opportunity ahead of you? And one thing that we know and we believe in very firmly is that your customers are gonna lead you there that the most important thing is to have that close connection with your customers. We did some research of about 2,000 consumers and 800 business decision makers earlier this year, and what we heard that they care about was, you know, of course, cost effectiveness, of course, uh, convenience. Consistency was an interesting one to me. They want you to show up consistently for them. They wanna know that you're gonna be there regardless of how they're connecting with you, that you're gonna show up in a way that is consistent with who you are and who you say you are. And that's in every interaction, right? Not just in your advertising, not just in your email, but in every engagement that you have with them. Also interesting was, they're fine with you giving you data, but they wanna know there's gonna be a fair exchange for it. And then finally, they love digital. They want it, you know, I told the story of the One, one Medical and interacting on digital, they, people want that but they also want to know that they can get to a human when they, when they need to. So um, 
you know, in short, what they want are uh, great experiences that enable them to uh, get done what they need to get done, which, as we all know, is incredibly easy, right? That's what you're all, you, every day is super easy for you. And we've all seen this stat, we've all lived this stat in one way or another, right? The software projects are really challenging, right? Implementing software that enables an amazing customer experience is hard. Doing one project is hard, running a massive program is hard, owning your digital product and ecosystem is incredibly difficult. And this is, this is difficult because, A, we've all got a bunch of tech debt, most likely, um, and technology keeps changing. And on top of that, you know, this is, I, I would say, probably the biggest challenge is organizations, right? It's, we're asking, and especially with AI, is gonna be very disruptive to how we work. And that's gonna be the thing that slows us down. I mean, le legislation may be an issue too, but I think it's mostly going to be resistance from the org, resistance about change. And so a lot of our job, all of you in the room, a lot of your job is to help your organization understand the vision and move along on the journey. So in order to transform and win, our belief is that those are the two fundamentals that you need to get right. You've got to have a clear vision, you've got to get the organization bought into that vision, and then you've got to bring them along in the journey. You've got to engage them in the conversation Help them understand where, they're, where you're headed, how their role may be evolving, how it's gonna change, how they're gonna have a voice in the conversation, and how you can win together, really, ultimately, right? People wanna know how they can help the organization be successful and win. So, speaking of uh, organizations that have transformed in, in service of their customer and really getting into a deeper customer relationship, I am excited to welcome to the stage Alicia Kreiner, Everybody, give her a warm welcome. Hello. Thank you, Pete. I'm saying yes. I blend in with the, <laughs> the background of the stage. Yes, well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was good, well planned. Um, so thanks for joining us. We've been on this journey for a couple of years um, and, and had massive success. And this has been, I mean, we're at Connection, so you could have guessed this, but this has been a, uh, shared journey, shared partnership between Salesforce and Galderma and Merkle. Um, and really, so much of it has been about getting closer to, getting closer to their customers. Uh, Galderma, you'll hear about, about what they do and the products they sell, um, but most of those interactions are, are not direct with customers, and so they wanted to move beyond just reaching their customers and move into a conversation and engagement and relationship with them. Um, it's a really powerful story. So, Alicia, maybe we just start with you talking about yourself and your background and how you got here. Sure, absolutely. So I'm Alicia Kreiner. I'm the Global Head of Digital and Media at Galderma. Galderma is the largest and leading pure play dermatology company. So you have three different business units, our consumer business unit, so dermatological skin care. You may be familiar with brands like Cetaphil, uh, hence the colors, <laughs> and uh, we're blue and green, and Elastin uh, for the skincare side. Injectable aesthetics, so that includes brands like Dysport, Restylane, so think uh, toxins and fillers. And then lastly, our prescription unit, uh, therapeutic dermatology. So think of solutions for eczema, psoriasis, and rosacea, like a cleave. Uh, so we're really built around you know, caring for the skin as a company. And for myself, I've been in this role uh, for a few years now. Um, I have a background in consumer technology, so I'm not sure if we're allowed to name names, but some of the uh, big houses like Microsoft and Amazon and before that with L'Oreal, uh, now with Galderma. So I've really always been in this consumer technology, uh, consumer brand and skincare space. Yeah, that's an awesome blend of tech and consumer products. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so you guys at, at Galderma have been through, since you've been there, an interesting journey. Do, and you guys recently IPO'd. Do you yeah. wanna just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was really exciting. So March 22nd, we uh, were listed on the Six Swiss Exchange, so we're now publicly traded on the Swiss stock market. And it was definitely a journey going from, you know, kind of an established public company to going to a privately held company, uh, just where you're really building up the business and building your story for not only the consumers and customers, but for the investors as well. So we constantly have different kind of customer groups. The investors are also a customer group uh, for us in that stage. And I also had the honor of actually hosting our live stream that day. Uh, I was very uh, intense, but also exciting to be live and actually ring uh, the bell from uh, Zurich in Switzerland. And in true Swiss fashion, we had a Treichlin, which is an antique uh, cowbell 
uh, to ring for the bell. So it's actually very, very cool. And we have a little video uh, that we can show. Yeah, let's run it. Welcome to Zurich for a truly special occasion. Today is Galderma's first day of trading on the Six Swiss Exchange. It's really great to be here and I can virtually feel the energy in the air. And today is a really big day for all of us. Our purpose as a company will not change to advance dermatology for all skin stories. Today's IPO of Galderma is the first IPO on the Six Swiss Exchange. But even more important, it's one of the largest IPO in Europe in recent years. Today is not just another Friday in the office. In fact, it's a historic milestone as Galderma makes its debut on the public market very shortly. It's a special moment to be here today. I think it's a testament to the Galderma teams everywhere all over the world. Who is the leading dermatology company in the world. Well, as you can see, I'm proud to say the answer is unequivocally Galderma. Ladies and gentlemen, we open the market. You can ring the bell. That's awesome. What a cool experience. Yeah, and having your uh, CEO do a live chat GPT <laughs> when you are the head of digital <laughs> it makes you hold your breath for a bit. But um, again, just a testament to our journey of really building our systems internally and also with partners such as Merkel and, of course, our Salesforce uh, tech stack. Yeah, I was just, uh, I was thinking about that chat GPT. <laughs> that must have been a little scary. Yeah, live demos. <laughs> All right, so I have a question for you. So have you... I mean, I know everybody in Switzerland speaks English, but have you had to learn French or German or no? Uh, I haven't had to learn it, but uh, I pick up on some phrases here and there from my L'Oreal days and also now with oh, right. the uh, Swiss true. team. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. awesome. All right, so you can see here on this slide all of the brands in the portfolio, which is amazing. Um, and, you know, one of the things I think, and maybe these are your tech roots coming through, right? You, you, you talk about... Well, we all know about fintech, we know about ad tech and martech, we know about med tech, you talk about derm tech. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? Yeah, so uh, you know, one of our uh, vision and ambition statements is advancing dermatology for every skin story. And if you look across our portfolio of brands, as I mentioned, we have our three different business units. We looked and realized that in the digital, physical, and virtual spaces, we have dermatology technology for all. So a great example is in our aesthetics world, um, the actual syringe that we use. There's different types of syringes. Some can leave marks, some have different injection techniques. That's part of our derm tech story. Uh, in digital, and we'll get to some of our AI pieces in a minute, that's also part of our derm tech story. And also, if you want to actually see the skin, or our healthcare practitioners, we have a virtual headset we can actually go into the different skin layers and learn about injecting and learn about the different skin layers. So we realize with all of this coming together, we're not a technology company, but we're advancing dermatology through tech as well and derm tech. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. I mean, it's such a growing category that um, it's a good way to separate a little bit from the pack. Um, so let's talk, I mean, if you look at these brands, right, some of these are for consumers, some are for healthcare professionals. How do you think about balancing and, and just managing communication to those different audiences? Yeah, you know, we were talking about this, you know, at, at actually at breakfast today, and um, we have multiple consumer touch points. Uh, consumers uh, use our skincare products, patients who go to a doctor's office to get a prescription. Uh, from a customer perspective, we look at some of the retailers, the Walmarts, the Boots of the world, if people are familiar with uh, the UK, um, and also our doctors and prescribers. So we need to have direct, direct, excuse me, direct connections with each of those uh, different touch points. Yeah, it's, it, which is, it's a lot to balance. Um, and as, as we talked about also at breakfast, like it's a much more complex industry than just straightforward 
consumer packaged goods, right? It's, it's you know, no, understanding the regulatory environment, understanding what you can say and what you can't say is, is a, it's a lot, right? Yeah, one of the examples I think I gave you is uh, in some countries you can't even say the word acne. You can't say the actual medical condition. So we have to find words of saying, you know, for instance, blemishes or redness prone versus, you know, in the U.S., we say acne. You, say, you can say a lot of things in the U.S., honestly, compared to some countries. So when you're the head of digital and you're looking at your SEO or SEM strategy or your, uh, your data collection strategy, we have to keep all of these different things in mind. Yeah, all right, so speaking of data collection, right, as I said at the top, this, a lot of this journey was moving from just connecting with customers to then starting to engage with them and build a relationship with them over time and really have a conversation with them. How, I guess, what have you learned in that journey? I mean, you talk about data collection and that being a priority and first and zero party data both. Like how, how what's, what's worked, what hasn't, how, how has that journey gone? You know, you, you alluded to it earlier in your opening, you know, people will gladly give you their information if they feel there's an exchange. So for instance, on our consumer side, we know people are looking for coupons. So we try to get them an incentive to give us more information so we can customize uh, their skin type, their location, and what type of products to give coupons for. When working with healthcare professionals, so our kind of B2B side of the house, you know, they're, they're trained as doctors. They're not trained as salespeople. They're not trained on how to use products. So we have education programs and webinars, and we actually have an HCP portal that's built on our Salesforce uh, tech stack to really help them learn the business side of the story as their expertise is uh, in dermatology and being a physician. Yeah, that's cool. All right, well, let's, I wanted to spend some time talking about, you know, we've put in place this global platform on, all Salesforce technology, um, and it gets activated in local markets. So how do you think about getting the leverage out of this investment globally, but making sure the markets are able to get done what they need to get done at the local level? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, you know, it, it, I, you know we, we could talk to the audience after this. And in the old world, I guess I'd say, you know, we'd start with our global master and just kind of force everyone and push out the updates to the different markets. We actually now work with pilot markets to take the lead, and we'll get to that in a minute. But what I do want to touch on on this slide here, I know there's some uh, different pieces on here. Again, we have to speak to both the consumer patient, but also to the healthcare professional. And it's very different language, very different regulatory pieces, different tools needed. We have kind of three buckets that we use when we're doing this. So service experiences. So for example, kind of you know, back to the coupons. What are people looking for uh, from a service perspective? How can we give them information and make it easier for them to go through the funnel or access information? Marketing experiences, you know, um, events, webinars, um, different content experiences. And then lastly, commerce experiences. We all are running businesses here. It's great to, again, provide services. We have to drive the sales as well. Uh, for our Cetaphil site, our flagship skincare brand, we're actually not direct to consumer. And I remember going to Dreamforce last year and seeing all these great examples of D2C brands. And it made me think, well, how are brand sites still driving sales with the Salesforce program? So we use everything from Service Cloud, Data Cloud, Datarama, Marketing Cloud. I know we're going to get into some of the actual pieces later. Um, but doing this to really drive that full experience of sales while also providing a service. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, yeah, let's talk about that. You touched on sort of starting with a key market and then rolling it out. As you, what maybe we can talk about the product finder first and um, how, you know, how you rolled that out and how you thought about it. Yeah, so the product finder is a great example. So think about your own, you know, daily lives. I think, you know, I, transparently I'm a little congested because allergies are just not stopping for me. Um, but it also can affect your skin. You may notice this time of year your skin may be more dry or more oily. And you Google, what type of skincare product should I use? And you get a thousand <laughs> different results. So again, back to how are we serving our customers and our consumers? We develop a product finder. And again, instead of just doing it at the global master, we decided to start with a pilot market. So we started with the US as an MVP, our minimum viable product. And we actually put together uh, with your team, as well as the Merkle team, over 3,000 different product combinations and recommendations uh, for our consumers. So you go to the Cetaphil website, you can select face or body, as you see in the visual here, and we take you down um, some different logic paths of how to select the different combinations of dry skin, oily skin, um, some other information maybe about your age, 
your weight, other factors that go into it. And there's so many different product recommendations that we can provide. We could not do this without all of the different pieces you see here listed. Data cloud, marketing cloud, service cloud, experience cloud. It really takes all of this decision tree making to really have a good, robust experience. Once we saw success in the US, then we rolled out to Canada, India, and Germany, and then we continue rolling it out to our different tiered markets. Yeah, that's awesome. Do, do the other, how do the markets feel about that? Do they all want to, are they raising their hand to be the, the first to be a pilot, or would they rather somebody else try it out for them? So I'm so glad you asked that question. You know, for those who work in global roles or kind of, you know, cross-functional roles, everyone says they want it, right? Everyone, you say the word AI, which we're going to get to, everyone raises their hand, they jump up. When you tell them the technical pieces that go into it, the budget behind it, the sustainment plan, because we can't just launch it and leave it. We have to keep feeding it and keep growing it. That's where you start to see the interest start to wane. So that's how we stopped doing kind of these big global releases and really focused on pilot and drive markets first. Then we assessed which markets could continue rolling it out and honestly put budget behind uh, keeping it going. Yeah, that's interesting. We're, I mean, we're not going to go deep into budget here, but I was talking <laughs> with somebody last night uh, about that same challenge of like some of the markets, the smaller markets really, they're the most entrepreneurial, but they also have the smallest budgets. Yeah. So it, it's, there's some tension there. Yeah, absolutely. And also too, again, from, I know we're not going to get into budget, that could be its own <laughs> summit. <laughs> yeah, it would. But um, it is helpful to go with the MVPs first from the larger markets like the US, Canada, and India, because then we can take the learnings and either scale down, scale up as needed, for the other markets and be more efficient. Because remember, at this time, we were still a private company. We didn't have the whole, you know, the, the, the public access to funds uh, and to uh, resources like we do now that we're public. When you're private, you really want to be as efficient as possible, and you really have to prove that proof point of every dollar. Every do when you're when you're held by private equity funds, every dollar needs to have a return. So this is the way for us to be more efficient with our uh, development. That's cool. All right, so you mentioned AI. Let's let's hit of on course. that. So every it's obviously a massive. Starting last year, it was really a big conversation here, um, and continues to be this year. What, tell us how you're thinking about it and how you're bringing that into the organization. Yeah, you know, I want to give a you know maybe not disclaimer, but I do want to give a statement that I've been hearing at these different conversations. Don't do AI for the sake of AI. I think a lot of us in this room are marketers, developers, and your boss and your boss's boss is asking, what's our AI strategy and what are we doing to get ahead of AI? So it's not about checking a box, it's making sure that it actually is useful for your customers internally or externally as well. So we sought out to look into what can we do with AI or how can we leverage it in the skincare dermatology case. Many different use, excuse me, use cases came up. Um, I'm gonna get into our Cetaphil example for a moment, but two ones I wanted to just kind of talk about was one, we have a product called Face by Galderma, and it's actually for our healthcare professionals. It's an augmented reality tool where you can scan someone's face and live um, augment what types of fillers or toxins or treatments. So you can see it before and after before committing to actually uh, getting a treatment or a procedure. And like you mentioned in your opening as well, it's not that AI is replacing, it's a doctor managing this tool as well. So you get that personalized touch with the doctor. The other piece, which is really interesting and that kind of nerd out for a second in the medical side and healthcare side, um, we're using AI in clinical studies. So how do we actually find solutions faster? How do we actually find the right people to run these studies with and understand uh, what indicators can lead to what uh, solutions as well? So that's how we've been starting to use AI kind of in the healthcare side of things. On the consumer side of things, uh, like the product finder you just saw, it's a bit manual. You still have to click through and find your recommendation. We wanted something more personalized, and that's when we found there was an AI solution. And partnering with you all and one of our uh, other partners, Perfect Core, we came up with the Cetaphil Skin AI Analysis Tool. So you can kind of see an example here of how you scan your face, uh, and you can get different recommendations based off of your own skin. The other great part for us as marketers, we get so much data for this. So we know um, how often people are scanning their skin, what type of uh, rich data, so for instance, age, demographic, uh, skin type. So it's a great exchange for us to get data and for our consumers to have a great uh, tool to use. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, it's, it is pretty powerful with Gen AI and people using natural language to communicate with you. They're telling exactly what they want and need, right? It's really powerful. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, okay, cool. I want to share some of the examples and have you talk us through these different activations that you've done, um, different ways you've connected with, with customers using AI. So maybe we just walk through each of these. Yeah. So the first one, so just kind of taking a step back, we launched this wonderful skin analysis AI tool, I want to say this time last year. Big splash, media, you guys know how big launches go. And then, you know, the big, shiny, exciting tool starts to fade away. So how do we keep customers engaged? How do we keep our own teams engaged with this? So we decided to use this during our uh, Fashion Week takeover that we just had. So Cetaphil as a brand is a quick background. We're focused on sensitive skincare and sensitized skin. So some people think, you know, I don't have sensitive skin, but if you're wearing clothing and you get kind of an irritation, you do have sensitized skin. So we decided to go to Fashion Week and share that message of science and fashion. Not just another beauty brand behind the scenes, but really how do we connect sensitive skincare to fabric? So you can see that first video you showed was all about getting people excited for the science side. And we're, we're going to Fashion Week to make science very cool. The second piece, if you want to show the video. Get ready with me for New York Fashion Week with Alex Melodius. Hydration is everything. To keep my skin dewy and fresh, I love to goop my glow with Cetaphil. So we partnered with Alice and Olivia. They are a uh, fashion brand, a fashion house, to be the exclusive skincare sponsor behind the scenes. So the key to any great, uh, you know, get ready with me for the social uh, people out there. Uh, before you even get ready, you need to have that first base layer of skincare for both face and body. So leading with science, showcasing how the products can work before a big event or big moment. And like I mentioned, the most important piece of this is bringing in the science. So we actually partner with High Snobiety. They're a fashion and media house and chill house, which is a wellness brand. Uh, we actually brought doctors to Fashion Week. I don't know how many brands bring doctors <laughs> to the stage. And you can see our pop-up uh, with them showing, you know, people got to come in for consultations and figure out what their skin type was. And again, maybe there's some fabrics or maybe there's some products that are irritating your skin. And the last part of this, again, how do we tie it all together with AI? So again, we have this wonderful AI tool that's just kind of sitting on our website, right? So we found a way to, uh, to in integrate this into the campaigns. So we actually invited our influencers and invited our doctors to use the AI tool and captured some content here. So every time we contract with influencers or key opinion leaders, we ask them to incorporate not just the skincare side of it, but also the derm tech side of it. So include the technology piece uh, that Galderma has uh, created. Oh, that's cool. Lots of great activations. All right, so let's take a step back. And I thought it'd be good for people to just understand when we developed the skin AI tool with you, like what was the, what did the process look like? What was the brief? So maybe we just start there with the brief itself. What did that look like? Yeah, so again, you know, we have the product finder. We're getting really good usage out of it, but we're missing that personalization component. So the first piece was, what is something that we can have for a visual technology scan? So what's the tech stack? What, what tech partners can we use? Um, you know, the problem we're trying to solve for is how do we help our customers find better solutions for their skin? So always start with that customer insight. Then we looked into the technology. And then also, why would they give us their data back? We had to figure out what's the exchange piece there. So we put together a brief that tried to capture all of those moments uh, together. Yeah, OK, awesome. And then, um, I guess, how did this solution come together? Yeah, so um, just, you know, I will say working with your team was incredible. Um, we built our CRM program on Marketing Cloud, I want to say when I first joined in 2021. Mm -hmm. We started with one website on Commerce Cloud and rolled out to 40 different countries, I want to say in 18 months. Um, there's a few gray hairs in here that are being tucked <laughs> in from that process. Yeah, we've got a few, too. Yeah, <laughs> but it was a really exciting time um, to bring that to life. So what's the next thing? How, again, how can we keep building on this tech stack, um, inviting our customers back to um, enjoy our products and enjoy our solutions? So we partnered with your team, with the Merkle team uh, and the Perfect Core team. They have a technology where you can scan uh, your face. It's typically used for makeup. Skincare companies haven't really used it yet. So it's a great chance for us to be the forefront, uh, to be the forerunner there. 
The next piece was that we needed to make sure that also it was inclusive. And I know we've heard a lot of things about um, in the AI world and augmented world that you know sometimes the scanners can't pick up on different skin tones, ages as well. Sometimes the ages don't uh, pick up as well. So how can we find um, a technology that really uh, takes that into account? The other piece was, again, the data piece. What types of data did we want to collect? Because you know, I, I'm sure you all have gone through this too. There's a fine line between three questions, four questions, five questions. And sometimes there's the drop off of not enough data or asking for too much. So how do we find that right, uh, that right line of recommendation with data collection? And then lastly, how do we have a full 360 experience? We don't want our tools to kind of just live by themselves. We want them to be integrated on the website uh, within our CRM program, uh, within all the other different uh, components that we have, like with influencers, with our healthcare practitioners as well. Yeah, you, I think you guys have done a really good job of, you know, marketers, as you know, you guys all probably saw the article in the Wall Street Journal, marketing budgets over the last few years have gone from 11% to 7% of sales. That's a pretty big drop. And so you have to do a lot more with less. And I think you've done a great job of taking these investments you've made in the platform and leveraging them with every activation to make sure you're getting the most out of it. Yes, That's great. Absolutely. Um, so anything, here's, here's what the tool looks like. I don't know if there's anything you want to add here. Yeah, so like how does it work, right? We yeah. talked a lot about Fashion Week and, yeah. <laughs> and data clouds. Uh, how does it actually work? So we'll have a, a QR code for you guys to scan and try it out for yourselves. But essentially you scan your skin and you get uh, with your, you can do it on your phone, your uh, desktop, mobile, iPad, and you're given a score. So we give you a ranking across different features um, as far as redness, um, acne prone, oiliness, and we give you a ranking. So again, it's not in a negative sense, it's more of an, a score to understand the different components of your skin. You can see the spider graph we have here, and also uh, to help with recommendations of maybe you have low hydration, maybe you're blemish prone. Then we give you personalized recommendations. So again, the product finder, it's more of a carousel of different products you can use if you may be oily. Here we can say, Jackie or Pete, here's specifically what your regimen is going to look like. And again, for the data piece, what you can do is learn more about the product, and we'll take you through the funnel. You can give us your email address to have the report sent to you. And what we do now is quarterly send reminders of the seasons have changed or has your body or skin type changed over the time. Come back and engage with us. And also too, we know again, people want coupons. So we have different um, customer groups that we can put them in, um, engage for coupons, engage for um, skin analysis and education, engage to go through our funnel uh, to check out for uh, shopping and e-commerce. People always want coupons. People, I'm, I'm the coupon <laughs> queen over here myself, so. <laughs> yeah, I know we've really leveraged the platform to make sure we're dropping people into the right journeys, right, and, and put each segment into them. It's been really powerful for that. Do you want to talk a little bit about the results that we've gotten? Yes, so um, again, it, it doesn't matter how great your technology is if you're not seeing the results. So we saw an increase in overall engagement, an increase in overarching website traffic. We actually see consumers now searching for our uh, skin AI tool. So we're seeing the SEO and SEM uh, joint uh, co uh, components there. And also again, like I mentioned, we have the product finder and the skin analysis tool, but they actually work in tandem now. Because sometimes not everyone wants to scan their face or maybe it's just hard, you're in low lighting, you're in public, you may just want the product finder. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to have a complementary uh, different options for our customers, uh, not just one. The other piece that you mentioned, and again, I know we all go through this, it really helps us justify why we're investing in these. So we know, and I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say numbers, but we know there's a higher probability of those who use this tool who will click through and shop in our e-commerce platforms. So we, like I mentioned, we're not direct to consumer. We don't own all of the purchase data, but we do know who we're sending and where we're sending them to. We use the sidebar channel site as our e-commerce uh, plug. But we know that, for instance, the more people who use the product finder typically go to Walmart. The people who use our AI tool typically go to Amazon. So we're able to build out different strategies with our sales team and our e-commerce team to, again, justify those marketing budgets that to get the return uh, from these investments. Yeah, so that's so important, I think, is to understand those high value moments and you know what, what's happening with them and how they're performing. And the, you know, something like a product finder is always, if someone's willing to engage at that level, right, that means they're, they're committed. Um, 
So, well, so first of all, let's make sure everybody, you could, here's the QR code if you want to try out the, the tool. Um, give it a shot. And I'd love your feedback, so feel free to find me afterwards and let us know your feedback. Yeah, and send Alicia any feedback. Um, I, the, I, I just want to make sure we hit on you know, some of the challenges or hurdles that you've seen along the way. And I opened up by talking about, hey, you need a bold vision, which you guys had, which was right this transition from just connecting with customers to building a, lo a lifetime of relationships. Um, but in terms of the hurdles that you hit and bringing the organization along on the journey, how, tell us about that. How did that go? What, you know, what lessons did you, have you learned from that? Yeah, so you know, and I'm, I'm glad we had our breakfast chat. Kind of helped me put some thoughts together on this. You know, Galderma historically uh, really is more of a pharmaceutical company. And uh, this is actually learnings for me. Maybe those who are in the healthcare world know this better. But the way the pharmaceutical model is, is that you apply for your uh, new drug or new biologic. The FDA approves. It gives you about 10 to 15 years of exclusivity. So that's why you see certain commercials of people riding bikes and playing with dogs uh, for you know about five years. And then you lose that exclusivity, and then generics come on the market. And then you kind of move on to the next drug. So it's kind of a cycle when it comes to pharmaceuticals. Skincare, branding, consumer goods is completely different. You're really trying to build a relationship with your consumer. Cetaphil is 77 years old. It's a very different strategy for a 77-year-old brand versus a biologic or drug that comes around every 10 years. So I would say, you know, in my position, because I work across all of our different business units, it's really bringing our management team into understanding what type of tools and technologies can really get that customer experience, that customer loyalty, but also drive sales, whether it's a prescription, a treatment, or an in-store uh, purchase. Mm, yeah, I think f for all of us, right, being able to connect the effectiveness of this back to the organization so everyone understands the power of these tools that we're putting in place is so foundational and so critical. Yeah, we always say brand marketing drives sales. You know, sometimes people put things in different buckets like brand marketing, performance marketing. We believe brand equity does drive sales and we use Cetaphil as that proof point. Whereas like I mentioned in prescription or in aesthetics, it's more about, it's a little more cyclical in a different way than right. more of a brand love story. Yeah, interesting, different challenges within, within the portfolio. So I guess last question for you, do you, where, how do you feel the organization is doing on the journey to embracing digital and technology as a powerful way to connect with consumers? Would you, how would you score yourselves? Yeah, I, I think we're uh, definitely on the right track. Um, I think, like I said, there was this, like most companies, there was AI, you know, I think uh, two years ago it was metaverse, NFTs, and there's always a buzzword um, each year, personalization, marketing automation. I think uh, we're moving in this point, where we're getting more mature with our decision making of not just jumping at the bit for the first, uh, you know, kind of big trendy thing that comes, but really building it into our strategy. That's why the derm tech, dermatology technology piece is so exciting because it's not just digital or CRM or AI, it's also how we're using our physical tools and our services to really serve our healthcare professionals and our consumers. So I think it's getting off of the mentality of what's quick, what's now, and really understanding what's going to serve your base and what tools do you need to build that. Yeah, that's awesome, love it. Um, all right, everybody, I want you to give a warm round of applause to Alicia Kreiner.